we now move on to the second part of the poem which is titled choric song now Tennyson calls it the choric song I guess because it is it is a chorus of men who are speaking you know now all these people who had eaten the lotus fruit they are in no mode to continue with the voyage they want to stop it here and now and they are trying to convince Ulysses and the others who have not eaten the fruit to join them and they are <coughs> laying down the reasons one after the other as to why it is better to remain in this island than to go back home so <coughs> that is why he calls it a choric song so let's uh, look at this choric song the first stanza so, so we have eight stanzas here and as i said earlier eight stanzas of uh, varying rhyme schemes and varying lengths you have uh, the first stanza i think has only 11 lines but then you have lines which uh, there are 16 lines 15 lines and more than that the last one is a pretty long <coughs> stanza so it's very irregular there and so this is how um, they are beginning and this is how it begins there is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in the gleam, gleaming pass music that gentler on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies here are cool mosses deep and through the moss the ivies creep and in the stream that long-leaved flowers weep and from craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep so how beautiful and so when you when you listen to this or when you read this you should actually picture it in your eye you yourself would want to go there and uh, eat this poppy and i mean poppy or um, uh, what is it because poppy comes there okay yeah, eat this uh, fruit and you too would want to just sit there so they they are trying to you know brainwash Ulysses and tell him uh, why we should stay back so he says uh, they say that there is sweet music here and um, such wonderful music I don't know what music can be heard there who is playing this music again we don't know but maybe it is the breeze or maybe it is uh, the music of some birds there whatever such soft music soothing music then petals from blown rose just look at the comparison he says that blown fully bloomed roses and when their petals fall it doesn't make any noise and where does the petal fall the petals are falling on grass so there is no noise whatsoever so the music that can be heard is so sweet. maybe maybe of course maybe this music is something that they hear only in their head because they are drugged you know so um, this music is something that Ulysses cannot hear or the people who haven't taken the fruit cannot hear it but they can hear this and so um, sweet music that falls softer than blown roses on the grass or night dews on still waters between walls so these the music falls slower than night dew on still waters between walls of shadowy granite so like when a dew falling on still waters so soft so slow so silent and uh, music oh well i love this particular comparison music the gentler on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes how can it be described more beautifully i really don't know like when you are sleepy and your eyelids are tired your eyes are tired and how welcome it is for you then to just close your eyes and go to sleep so this music is like that you know it's so soothing it's so uh, attractive you would not want to open your eyes at all from this kind of a sleep so that is the kind of music that they can hear music that brings sweet sleep down from blissful skies and then they, he says or he I keep saying he uh, because we're used to when when we say that somebody is speaking it's easier for us to say he uh, please uh, don't be mistaken what I mean is they okay and so um, and then they say that if you're feeling sleepy you know there is all kinds of attractive places for them to lie down there is uh, their cool moss on which they can simply lie it is softer uh, than uh, the beds that they have been sleeping in and here for a long time you know for 10 years 10 years of war and another uh, 10 years of or 10 or 9 years of uh, voyage on the sea 
it must have been long since they had a comfortable sleep on a good comfortable bed so here it is this is such a welcome change for them and so the mosses uh, make a natural bed for them so let's sleep here and uh, you have ivy fl flowers or ivy leaves creeping through these moss uh, and you have long leaved flowers weeping weeping in the sense uh, they stand by the stream and so uh, the flowers are moist maybe the water from the stream has been sprayed on the flowers and so the flowers seem to weep and from the craggy craggy is a uh, rough stony uh, ledge the poppy and you have the poppy flowers poppy flowers again you know that they can be drug inducing so the poppy flowers are sleeping so everybody is sleeping and so why can't we to sleep here that is the question stanza 2 why are we weighed upon with heaviness and utterly consumed with sharp distress where all things hell else have rest from weariness all things have rest okay this is the second point that uh, they are stressing upon so why should we lead such a, a distressed life everything else in nature have some kind of a rest from weariness then why should we alone take so much of trouble upon our shoulders all things have rest why should we toil alone we only toil who are the first of things and like perp and make perpetual mourn still from one sorrow to another throat so we and uh, what does he say who are the first of things first of things means the greatest or the crown of god's creation man prides himself to be the crown of creation so he says when everything else in nature has time to rest they don't toil like us then why should we the special and the privileged creatures of god suffer through a life like this why should we mourn our life is a perpetual mourn and we are being thrown from one sorrow to another is there no kind of a reprieve for this is there no end to a suffering so a very very logical argument isn't it uh, so he says still from one sorrow to another thrown nor ever fold our wings and cease from wanderings he, he com the comparison there you can see this is not uh, this is a metaphor it's not exactly a, a simile it's a metaphor so they are compared to birds who have uh, spread their wings and they've been flying and flying and flying for a long time when will the time come for us to fold our wings and sit somewhere and take rest so nor ever fold our wings and cease from wanderings nor steep our brows in slumber's holy balm so sleep many writers have uh, called sleep the balm a balm that eases all sufferings of man however tired or however unhappy you are you just sleep and wake up you wake up as a refreshed person so that's why he says slumber is a holy balm so why can't we just lie down somewhere and allow sleep to apply its curing and healing balm on us nor hearken what the inner spirit sings there is no joy but calm okay so the inner spirit always tells us that the ultimate joy is calmness is serenity so what are we seeking for all when you look at it that way all the great saints and uh, seers they all say that uh calmness is the ultimate once you discover this inner calm your life is fulfilled so that being the truth then why are we toiling is the very genuine question that these people are asking their leader why should we only toil the roof and crown of things so we are the roof and crown of things the greatest of all creatures and why should we alone toil while even the lesser creatures are leading a peaceful life now the third stanza now when you listen to this aren't you kind of convinced that it's better to stay in the island that's what happens you know and then he says in the third stanza lo in the middle of the wood the folded leaf is wooed from out the bud with winds upon the branch and there grows green and broad and takes no care sun steeped at noon and in the moon nightly dew fed and turning yellow falls and floats down the air so there he says you know just look at he says uh, he's arguing you know like a lawyer argues his case uh, they're arguing and they're saying you know just for example just look around you and just look at a, a leaf 
a leaf a tender leaf that is folded in the beginning the leaf is folded and then it is slowly wooed out from the bud and who who wooes it out it is the wind the gentle winds wake up this leaf and ask him to get up and grow and all that and slowly the leaf grows up it becomes green you know, initially when they are very tender you know that the leaves are not exactly bright green they are kind of yellowish or uh, and now they grow broad they grow green and they have no care in the world they don't have to worry about wars <coughs> they don't have to worry about falling in love or marrying somebody nothing okay just takes no care and in the afternoon when the sun is there they take in all the sun and in the night the moon feeds them with dew so a wonderful existence and then after some time what happens to the leaf it turns yellow then it falls very silently no complaints at all it has lived its life and <coughs> low sweetened with now now uh, that is one comparison the leaf the second comparison is to the 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 fruit the apple low now look at that hmm? what he means by low is just look at that listen to it sweetened with sun, the summer light the full juiced apple waxing over mellow drops in a silent autumn night all its allotted length of days the flower ripens now that's the third one so the apple he says it takes in all the summer light and it becomes a full juiced ripe fruit and then what happens after that when it's too ripe when it's over ripe over mellow it just drops on one autumn night because um in in it is in the spring season that these apple trees start to bloom and then in summer the fruit really grows nice and big and by the time it's autumn it is fully done and it gets over ripe and it falls the uh, and then what uh, the next one is the flower he says all its allotted length of days the flower ripens in its place ripens and fades and falls and hath no toil fast rooted in the fruitful soil so what happens to flowers they to stand in the same place they ripen they when they when a flower ripens it gets to its fullest color bright beautiful and then it slowly fades and then falls no hard work involved and it uh, it is still fast rooted so again he is insisting on this fast rootedness why should we alone travel around that why can't we just put down our roots and stay in one place okay that's the question so that was stanza 3 uh, where he is uh, giving uh, the comparisons of the leaf and the apple and um, the flower and stanza 4 hateful is the dark blue sky vaulted over the dark blue sky see death is the end of life ah why should life or labor be this is a very popular line why should life or labor be let us alone time driveth onward fast and in a little while our lips are dumb let us alone what is it that will last all things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past let us alone what pleasure can we have to war with evil is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave all things have rest and ripen towards the grave in silence ripen fall and cease give us long rest or death dark death or dreamful ease so uh, the next stanza he be they begin with a lot of vehemence there is a kind of violence that you can feel in that um, in those words they say hateful is the sky and hateful vaulted over that is the sky which they can see over the dark blue sky they sick and tired of the dark blue sky and the dark blue sea because these are the only two things they have been seeing for the past few years so we don't want that and then he they say like after all what is the end of life it is death and then why should we um, kind of toil through life with all this difficult labor why should life or labor be why can't we be like these plants around us so and maybe the leader is constantly telling them now get up let us go it's getting late let's go and uh, continue the voyage and so that's why they keep saying let us alone if you want to go you can go but let us alone hmm? that is the tone there and the time anyway it moves forward and after some time we won't our lips are dumb in the sense we will be dead very soon so let us alone Uh, what is there that will last so what is the meaning of life why should we toil so much whatever we get whatever we gain all the riches that we earn all the fame that we gather everything will be lost do we take it along with us when we die no then why are we toiling so hard 
all things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past okay so many writers you can see they have this uh, preoccupation of the past and the present and the future that human beings are always bothered about the past and so here he says whatever we do after some time it will all become the past then why that's the question what pleasure can we have to war with you why should we fight to people uh, and what is the uh, great thing in climbing up the climbing wave so why should we travel over these disturbing waters disturbed waters so once again swaying back to the uh, sentiment expressed in the previous stanza everything has rest and they all ripe and go towards the grave so let us also do that two options there you either kill us you just give us death or you just allow us to take a long rest dark death or dreamful ease and then uh, the fifth stanza how sweet it were hearing the downward stream with half shut eyes ever to seem falling asleep in a half dream to dream and dream like yonder amber light which will not leave the my bush on the height to hear each other's whispered speech eating the lotus day by day to watch the crisping ripples on the beach and tender curving lines of creamy spray to lend our hearts and spirits wholly to the influence of mild minded melancholy to muse the brew and brood and live again in memory with those old faces of our infancy heaped over with a mound of grass two handfuls of white dust shut in an urn of brass okay so again the same idea goes on he says like instead of uh, starting on the journey again how nice now now this is what he is going to say they are saying now how much easier it is to remain on this island let's remain here we can have such a blissful and a happy existence so you can just lie down here with half shut eyes and you can hear listen to the uh, downward stream the very soothing uh, noise of the water flowing and you can fall asleep in a sleep in a half dream so you can see in those lines there is so much of sleep and dream and they can just lie there and dream and dream and you can see the yonder amber light amber is the bright yellowish kind of light and uh, you can see that amber, because in that island uh, the the color tone is yellow almost all the time because it is as because it is as though it is afternoon all the time and so we can just lie down there and we can speak softly to each other because in that island nothing is loud everything is is slow everything is soft so we can whisper to each other we can eat lotus day by day so every day they can have a fresh supply of these fruits eat it once again go back to that very comfortable drowsiness and they can lie there and watch the waves they can look at the waves coming in the creamy spray and uh, they can uh, be mild minded they can muse and brood and they can l- go back to their memories of those old faces muse and brood and live again in memory with so uh, faces of our infancy means all the childhood memories and people who have de- who have died and left them that's what he means by saying heaped over with a mound of grass two handfuls of white dust shut in an urn of brass so he's talking about dead friends dead relatives dead uh, maybe the wife or the husband or parents or whoever is dead so now if we just lie there we can go back to those people uh, uh, the dear people that we have lost we can imagine that they are here with us we can talk to them we can uh, have a nice time with them so uh, he peeped over he's talking about the grave and white white handfuls of white dust is the ash of uh, once the dead person is interred you take the ashes and you put it in the urn like just like the indian practice and then you take it to some river and uh, put it there and same way here too the greeks too had maybe a similar practice and so uh, he says that how much easier is this because we can just sit here bring back our all our dear people from our memories talk to them live with them have a nice time because reality is always very disturbing and harsh because if they go back home they might find that many of their dear ones are dead so they have to face this a uh, very disturbing and painful reality of death and life so here they can just live they thinking that uh, everybody is there with them now in stanza 6 
they talk about their memories of the earlier life dear is the memory of our wedded lives and dear the last embraces of our wives their warm tears but all that had suffered change so he says yes it's true we uh, have memories of the wedded lives of our wives and um, the last embrace and how they cried when we set out on the voyage because they when we'll come back all that is true but he says but that has changed it's a long time now see 20 years have passed so the people who must have been in their 30s must be 50 now those who would have been in their 40s must be 60 now so things have changed so what are we going back to for surely now our household hearts are cold heart is the fireplace so what they mean is that their place in their families must have gone 20 years is a long time people would have forgotten us by now our children would have grown up our wives would have learned to live without us so for surely now our household hearts are cold our sons inherit us our looks are strange so we look quite strange we all have long beards and such things and we look so strange and uh, not only that looks strange means they have become strangers to everything that is familiar so going back to their uh, old place would be very difficult actually because they will not fit in there they have been away for too long our sons inherit us our looks are strange and we should come like ghosts to trouble joy so they would not be happy to see us they would look at us like ghosts who have come to trouble them or else the island prince is overbold have eat our substance and the minstrel sings before them of the 10 years war in troy and a great deeds as half forgotten things so then uh, maybe uh, all our um, property has been taken over by uh, the prince who is there they must have taken over because they must have usurped all our property and all our because we have not gone back for a long time and uh, the bards must be singing of the troy the trojan war and they must be singing of our great deeds as half forgotten things like nobody is expecting us to go back they would have forgotten us that's what he's saying uh, and so then now he's asking is there confusion in the little isle let what is broken so remain the gods are hard to reconcile it's hard to settle order once again so he says like we have been in trouble because we have created uh, some uh, we have angered the gods and it's difficult for us to appease the gods because these gods once they are angry revengeful nothing can convince them to be otherwise and so let us not fight with the gods let us just decide to remain here because their life has been a long struggle i told you about the problems that ulysses had with some of the gods and so it's hard to settle order once again there is confusion worse than death trouble on trouble pain on pain long labor unto aged breath sore task to hearts worn by many wars and eyes grown dim with gazing on the pilot stars so he says life is it's it's very difficult sometimes life is more difficult than death because you have pain heaped upon pain you have uh, such hard work to do and we are not young anymore and our hearts are worn by long battles and our eyes have grown dim gazing at pilot stars pilot stars because these people have spent years on the sea so looking at the stars to guide them the evening star and the morning star uh, and so and the constellations so all that has made them almost blind our eyes have grown dim so we simply don't have it in us we don't have the strength for another fight to go there and set ourselves up again in a world which has already forgotten us we are not ready for all that and now stands a seven but prompt on beds of amaranth and molly how sweet while warm air lullus airs lullus blowing lowly so compared to that just look at what we have here how wonderful life is here because we have beds of amaranth and molly all those must be sweet smelling flowers or herb herbs how sweet while warm airs lullus blowing lowly with half dropped eyelids still beneath the heaven dark and holy to watch the long bright river drawing slowly his waters from the purple hill to hear the dewy echoes calling from cave to cave through the thick twined vine to watch the emerald colored water falling through many a woven acanthus wreath divine only to hear and see the far off sparkling brine only to hear were sweet stretched out beneath the pine 
so he gives they give a, a, a description of this beautiful place and how wonderful it would be there to lie there and listen to the river to just watch the river as though they they have they because they have nothing else to do and then uh, they can hear the echoes of, of many sounds and they can listen they can see the sea they can see s e e the sea s e a okay and the brine here sparkling brine refers to brine salt water so sparkling brine refers to the sea so we, how nice it would be to sit here or lie down here and look at the sea to hear the sea only to hear was sweet means he once again they are kind of underlining the fact that they only want to see the sea or hear the sea they don't want to go back and be in the middle of the sea so it's wonderful to stretch down here under a pine tree and look at the sea and listen to the sounds of the sea so isn't this any day better than the uncertainties the uncertain life that we are going to face back in ithaca and are we ever going to reach ithaca so all these questions are there and now we come to the last stanza which is the longest one the lotus blooms below the barren peak the lotus blows by every winding creek all day the wind breathes low with mellow tone through every hollow cave and alley lone round and round the spicy downs the yellow lotus dust is blown so everywhere i mean there there will be no dearth of lotus we can live here for years and years and there would be a steady supply of lotus flowers and lotus fruits we can eat them and eat them and eat them and continue this blissful state so we have had enough of action and of motion we ro- and of motion we rolled to starboard rolled to larboard when the surge was seething free where the wallowing monster spouted his foam fountains in the sea so he says oh my god enough of action and of motion we've been moving so long we've been acting fighting battling killing uh, trying to keep ourselves safe for such a long time and we've been rolling you know in the ship when the ship is tossed roll uh, starboard and larboard starboard is the left side of the ship and Now, larboard is the right side uh, or i mean the other way or left and right uh, sides of the ship i'm not exactly sure which is right and which is left but then mm, what he means is that when the ship is tossed these people you know they can't even hold on to anything so they are tossed to one side they are tossed to another side so constant motion they have been going through and sometimes what happens is the wallowing monster spouting his foam so wallowing monster is the whale so the whale sometimes comes right under the ship and he sends up the spout of water and the ship is carried up and it comes down again so a horrible life they have been living on the sea and so and so uh, now he says let us swear an oath so now this is done let us take a final decision and keep it with an equal mind so we are going to take a decision now and we are going to follow it in the hollow hollow lotus land to live and lie lie reclined so this is what we are going to do we are going to live here it's a hollow land because it is empty of many of the things that they have in in their own land and um, so we are going to live here and we are going to recline here live a peaceful life here we are not going back on the hills like gods together careless of mankind so let us live like the gods living on parnassus or mount tabor or wherever okay and the, the place the abode of gods and look at what he says careless of mankind so here we can see the victorian sentiment uh, because we know that in the victorian period people began to uh, doubt the significance of religion and people began to exist i mean to uh, doubt the existence of god because that was a time when science was growing mm, beyond our leaps and bounds and so uh, this was the time when darwin came up with his uh, uh, very revolutionary theory of the evolution of man and where darwin said that see man was not created by god as the bible says man actually is just one of the billions of creatures that evolved from a singular uh, cell single celled organism so that w- that was the time where this poem was written with the uh, advent of science and the progress of industrialization the people learned that many things which they thought only god could do 
now they could do on their own new machines which were totally unheard of were invented and so there was this confusion and this chaos which is called the victorian dilemma and so much was happening in so sh short a span of time and we can see the beginnings of the doubt here in um, tennyson's lines and uh, remember i mentioned earlier that tennyson is the most representative poet of the age and so here he says in this sentence on the hills like gods together careless of mankind so the hint that gods are careless of mankind gods are indifferent to the sufferings of mankind they don't care for man so that idea is there so what uh, the sailors are telling ulysses is that they can here if it is in this island they can continue to live a very happy life a relaxed life and they don't have to bother about anything like the gods lie in heaven uh, together and happy and careless of mankind we too can lie here and now the whole uh, the next few lines are about gods about gods and their callousness towards suffer the sufferings of um, human beings for they lie beside their nectar and the bolts are hurled far below them in the valleys and the clouds are lightly curled round their golden houses girdled with the gleaming world so they lie beside their nectar all comforts comforts are within their reach so they are very comfortable they are having a wonderful time there the gods and what they do is i mean they hurl bolts into the uh, the human world uh, so far below them in the valleys and their homes that is the golden houses girdled with the gleaming world it is um, secure it is covered it is cushioned in the clouds so they don't face any danger and they hurl bolts down into the world and from there they can look down and they can see what is happening here they smile in secret where they smile in secret looking over wasted lands blight and famine plague and earthquake roaring deeps and fiery sands clanging fights and flaming towns sinking ships and praying hands so they have a wonderful time watching the drama going on uh, down below human beings are suffering because when the bolts are hurled lands are wasted there is blight there is famine that is famine of course is lack of food blight again is disease plague earthquake uh, roaring deeps fiery sands okay seas and sands and deserts and there are fights and towns are burning ships are sinking people are praying but the gods are not bothered so that praying hands is very very significant so the gods are indifferent and they smile they find a music centered in a doleful song steaming up a lamentation and an ancient tale of wrong like a tale of little meaning though the words are strong chanted from an ill used race of men so you can see in all these lines the kind of contempt that gods have towards man and so that is what is expressed here that gods don't care for people they inflict all kind of uh, um, hazards and tragedies on the human world and they enjoy it and they watch it with great interest and they smile and the cry of the sad cries of uh, the human beings are like music to the gods they smile they find the music centered in a doleful song and uh, it also and it also says this music it it rises from an ill used race of men so there again you can see the unhappiness he calls human beings an ill used race of men and these men what are they doing the whole time they cleave the soil that is they plow the soil the hard soil and they try to cultivate things sow the seed reap the harvest with enduring toil storing yearly little dues of wheat wine and oil so they try to make something out of their hard work they try to store a little wheat a little wine and a little oil this is what happens throughout human life you keep toiling and toiling and what do you gain out of it and finally till they perish and they suffer and what happens after death is there any kind of respite after death 
no you're not sure because some it is whispered down in hell suffer endless anguish others in elysian valleys dwell resting weary limbs at last on beds of asphodel so there is no guarantee that even after death you're going to be happy because some people are fated to go to hell and suffer there so the continue it is just a continuance of the suffering on earth a different kind of suffering but there too it is suffering after all and a few others a select few go to elysium elysian valley elysium is the place where the great greek heroes were supposed to be taken after death Elysium is something uh, which is parallel or equal to um, heaven. And so uh, there again you can see there is uh, this disparity. And resting weary limbs. So the people who uh, reach Elysium by some good fortune, they will finally rest on beds of asphodel. Now asphodel is a kind of a flower and uh, it is said it was believed that uh, Hades and Elysium it is carpeted with asphodel flowers and this was supposed to be a favorite food uh, of the dead. So he says now let us compare and contrast this with the life that we are going to lead in this island. After all the trouble that we go through finally you're going to Elysium and a select few will go to Elysium and lie on beds of asphodel. Isn't that what we're doing here now because we are lying on beds of amaranthus and molly he said and we are having a nice time here. So then why take all this trouble? Surely, surely, slumber is more sweet than toil, the shore than labor in the mid, deep mid-ocean wind, wave and oar. So he says, slumber or sleep is better than hard work, is more, it is sweeter than hard work. And the shore, this shore, this island, this land is definitely better than laboring in the deep mid-ocean and the wind and fighting the wind and the wave and struggling with the oar against the strong waves so any day there actually stands no comparison between the two any day this is better or oh, rest ye brother mariners we will not wander more that's the last line or oh, rest ye brother mariners we will not wander more okay so um, they say that you have to take this decision this is the only um, choice open to us let us remain here let us not go back to our homes. Let us just continue leading a very blissful existence on this island. So that is how the poem ends. Actually what happens in uh, Odyssey, Odyssey is that um, Odysseus um, forces these men to leave the island. He ties them up, carries them, lifts them bodily and puts them on the ship, on board the ship and takes them home. And they are crying and lamenting, but he refuses to leave them there. He takes them and he goes off. That's what happens in the Odyssey. Here, this is where the poem ends. Um, we don't know what, how um, Ulysses responded to this particular choric song because Tennyson chooses to stop there. Okay, so that is the poem, uh, The Lotus Eaters.